Welcome to the podcast. Keenan Briggs here, athlete, coach, and mentor. Today's conversation is the podcast number seven, but podcast number seven is going to be about underappreciated coaches. More specifically, just the structure, how it's set up to appreciate its coaches and what it does to our track and field community. Of course, there are coaches that are underappreciated across all sports. However, I will be talking specifically around the realm of track and field. I'm going to be talking about um, what I define as a coach, what it means to me, and you know my own perception of what a coach is, what underpaid coaching leads to. I'm also going to talk about the structure of coaching and how they get paid. Then I'm going to take some time to gripe. Okay, you guys got to, yeah, okay. Then the last thing is I'm going to recap with some ideas to provide solutions. Okay, let's get right into it. So first thing is defining a coach. Obviously, a coach to me is a person that develops another person or a young adult or peer or whatever through the process of their sport career. Now, there's a huge difference between a trainer and a coach. A trainer is a person that is short-lived. They're specific to a certain area, such as a trainer may work on, you know, an injury, such as an athletic trainer. A trainer may work on the weight room aspect a trainer may work on you know uh, the grades something very specific very detailed but then when it comes down to a coach a coach has to be able to wear all hats a coach is a person that is in the weight room with an athlete if that is needed that is a mental coach when it comes to an athlete when it's needed a coach is a person that mentors an athlete in every single aspect of life also on the track a coach has to be able to balance all these things out and manage that athlete throughout their career typically a coach is with an athlete for a long period of time when I was a personal trainer I would have athletes for the summer I would have athletes in the weight room it was a specific amount of time that I would have them You know, if I was a trainer, when it comes down to track and field specifically, I would train them for a week or a session or a package of sessions. I was a private trainer. I wasn't a coach when I was doing those things. However, I doubled as a actual coach. I coach at a high school. You know, I have athletes that I work with for a long period of time. I coach a club track and field team. They're with me for a season or longer, but the goal is to develop them over the long haul. I think that's the main difference between a coach and a trainer. Also, a coach does so much more for less, for like pennies on the dollar. Trainers have a higher cost. That's why a lot of coaches double up as another uh, trainer on the side or they have another profession on the side. But the main goal is, you know, the, a professional in a certain type of path is going to be way more beneficial to attributing to your success. And the reason for it is because that person's job is simply to do that. So working with a personal trainer or a private coach or a professional trainer versus a professional coach literally um, are two different things. All right, next, moving on to underpaid coaching. And it's it's tough. So at the high school level, I believe the stipend is 2000 maybe $3,000 for a high school coach. That's not a lot of money when you think about how long a track meet is. You know, it can be five, six hours. Track meets can be anywhere between two to three hours, depending on if it's a dual meet or a invitational. You have practices, which are two hours per day. Um, You're maybe making phone calls to athletes to help them, 
you know, develop and whatever they may need. It's just a lot of work. And so when you think about it at the college level, these college coaches are receiving a lot more than that. And I'll go into detail with their specific pay later on. But you're looking at the same duties, but high school coaches getting paid less. And what I'm looking at is when you pay for something, let's just say you pay for a car or you pay for a service, typically in our Western society, we feel that when you pay a higher price, you should expect to receive a better quality of service. Now, if I go to, let's just say, McDonald's or Taco Bell, places I have and do eat sometimes, right, versus going to, I don't know, um, let's just say Olive Garden, right? They're both basically fast food chains. Olive Garden is a fast food chain, right? We still can say, well, you know what? If I went to McDonald's or Taco Bell, I'm going to expect a certain type of quality food. But then now I compare that to Olive Garden, even though it's still a fast food chain, it's a, it's a restaurant. I'm going to pay more per meal, which now means that I expect a better quality of food. Now if I go to another restaurant, maybe Morton's or um, any type of steakhouse, you know, that's a high-end place, maybe five stars, and it has people that are dressed in ties and suits and all this stuff, right? Well, I might be I might be paying fifty dollars for that same type of meal. Well, that same type of meal is gonna you know come with a higher standard. I'm gonna expect my experience, I'm gonna expect the service, the cooks to be of a certain level of quality simply because I paid so much more money. Well, when it comes to coaching, we kind of expect the same thing. But if high school coaches are getting paid two to three thousand dollars for a season and college coaches are getting paid upwards of thirty thousand forty fifty thousand dollars per season we expect the coaching to be a little bit different so I won't go too deep into that because I'm going to go into to a little bit deeper later on but what happens is let's say we stay consistent with that quality the issue is a College student is in college for four to five years when it comes to sports, right? When it comes to sports for high school, it's four to four years specifically. Very, it is four years. But then you think about all soldiers, youth, high school in general, athletes could spend upwards of 10 to 11 years in that youth sector. But when it comes to the pay structure, youth kids, youth coaches don't really get paid that much. Most of the time they're volunteer coaches. Then at the high school level you're paying them two to three thousand dollars per per season. So when you look at it is you're just spending close to ten years in this developmental process with coaches who are getting paid pennies on the dollar, pennies per hour. Versus when they finally do get to this collegiate level if they're lucky enough to get to that level off of natural talent then and they survive this lower quality version of training then you actually get the quality of training at the colleges simply because of this whatever I just showed um, displayed of coaches that are paid more should be able to offer a higher service better service so we're going through a bad process, it's a bad cycle of underpaid coaches that maybe offer an, a lesser value of service for a long time and then hopefully get to college and then get a better service. I think it should be the other way around or simply balance it out. So the, the loophole to that whole process is now we have private trainers and private coaches and, and and club teams. Now you have a coach that's creating his or her own value by saying, well, I'm going to charge you $3,000 per kid per season. That's going to make me a lot more motivated to coach. That's going to make me way more motivated to spend more time with these athletes and give them my all. 
that's also going to have the parent say, if I'm paying you $3,000, you better make my kid the best kid in the world. Well, guess what? That coach can if he or she has the tools to. All right. And I'll, I'll go into my gripe session later on about how to adjust those things as well. But let's move on to the structure of coaching and pretty much how it works. Now, when you are a youth coach, typically youth coaches are parents. Typically youth coaches are athletes that used to do something before and that kind of want to get started. So they start with a youth program because they can help, right? That'll be like after school programs. It'll be AYSO versions of track and field. Um, assistance for you know club teams but pretty much just the youth levels and they're typically not getting paid anything it's usually people that just want to help out then the goal of that typically is to get to the high school level when you're at the high school level now you're working with athletes who are needing development then when you get successful at that you start developing some athletes then all of a sudden you know there's a need of pay because you're like, well, if I'm coaching at the high school level making two to three thousand dollars per season, that only covers my gas. I need to work. So then they're working a full time job somewhere else and coaching the high school kids part time whenever they have time. They start to realize maybe I do love coaching. I want to coach and get rid of this part-time or this full-time job that I have. I don't want this desk job. I want to coach. So then they start applying for these college-level opportunities. Let's say they do get this college-level opportunity. Great. Now they're making, based on my research so far, um, between twenty to fifty thousand dollars per year. Again, it's not really livable, but it's a lot more money than making two to three thousand dollars per season because now you're making two to three thousand dollars per month so which that really adds up and it's really really good it, it helps so now you have these athletes that are making that but then they say I've been coaching high school, high school for a while I'm doing a great job what I want to do now is make more money because I'm getting older I want to have a family one day and fifty thousand dollars is not gonna cut it's not gonna cut it if I want to support a family then they get into the collegiate level. Now they're making more money. You know, an assistant that I've seen so far makes around seventy thousand, seventy-five thousand, upwards to a hundred thousand dollars for some higher-end um, D1 programs. So they get into that. They're making eighty thousand dollars or so. Now they're making the the standard of what I feel um, humans should be making per month even though our averages across the board are a lot less than that. But at that level, you're you're happy. Now you have coaches that are happy. They're eating good. They're able to go out on weekends with their friends and family. Now they can say, let's go and really focus on these athletes. However, they only have eight people on their roster if they're a jumps coach. They only have you know so many kids on their roster if they're um, at the university level. Also because they have multiple coaches on the staff. It, it divides up the overall workload and now a coach is happy coaches are happy at the college level I think they're happy at the lower levels but they're not happy in all aspects when it comes to um, development when it comes to their paycheck and etc and you also have full-time coaches you know uh, junior college is closer to high school when it comes down down to the structure but at the, at the high school level or the collegiate level coaches are full-time coaches now you're getting a lot more quality when it comes down to the training. Then from there, for those who really want to excel, they'll go into the professional coaching. And I'll talk about the structure about that right now. When it comes down to the professional coaching, it's more about who you know. And when a professional sponsor comes in and says, say Nike, they say, you know what, we're going to give you $100,000 as an athlete to continue your development because you're close to making that A standard or you are at that A standard. We want to um, provide you with some, some money. 
Well, within that, what happens is that athlete may say, well, I have my coach. I want to stay with my coach. So then Nike or whoever would then provide some money and funding for that coach to be able to continue. However, that Nike or whoever it is will say, well, we already have coaches in place that are very good and it kind of covers them because you don't want to pay a coach that just got lucky, right? And it makes sense. It's business. You want to have a coach that you know that is a quality coach. So they're going to give you a coach if you don't really have a coach and so on. My question is, who are those coaches? You know, a lot of times they are friends. They are great coaches. They are just lucky coaches. It's it's a wide range. But to get into that, you have to be cool with Nike or whoever those companies are. And again, I will go into the gripe session later on about that. But basically, when you get into this pro circuit when it comes down to sponsors, then you're in a good place because now you're getting paid a lot more and you're even more specific on what you um, need to do. Now you just have to work on one or two athletes and, and that's it. Now you get to travel. You get to do a lot of things that are um, pluses. All right. So... That's basically the structure. The loopholes around, you know, this structure is becoming a private coach. So now you are coaching full time. You have a private team or so. Let's say you have a team of individual clients. That works. You know, now, now they're paying you X amount of dollars. You may be making upwards of fifty to seventy thousand dollars with, you know, 10, 15, 20 athletes at that elite level or high school level or whatever which is good now you're making your money and you offer you're able to offer a good service you also have the other spectrum which was what I fell into was I created my own club team you know I got away from the private stuff because I felt that there were specific things that I didn't like to do um, and also also didn't want to deal with but now I, my club team is you know they pay X amount of dollars per month and I have so many athletes and that helps me live, which is very good and it helps me coach full time. And if you follow, you know, what I do, you'll see that I've been able to provide a good service for these athletes and help develop them and give them the best resources and opportunities moving forward. And that is my personal goal. You know, but many times it's tough, you know. I'm, I think I've talked about my own personal story before, but you know, you it's you have to be an entrepreneur. You have to be able to market. You have to be able to do so much more work. And when it comes down to the total hours of work that I do per day, it's nonstop. You know, there was a period of time where I was making, um, I w I was below poverty. I'll just keep it at that. I was below poverty. Yeah, it was tough. I was below poverty, and this was not like when I first started. It was for a long time, and I just recently got out of that situation, you know. And it took a long time, which is which is hard to do. But I stuck with it because I knew it was possible. But again, I have no children. I have no one to be responsible for other than myself. So I was able to take a lot of these risks, you know, that a lot of people aren't able to. Anyway, back on this this uh, this situation. The, here's my gripe. This is my gripe. If you want to fast forward, um, I, I don't know how far you need to fast forward, but there are two types of ways to become valuable when it comes to receiving more pay and also when it comes to getting promotions right now in the high school sector people who want to help are the ones who come help there are many vacancies when it comes down to high school coaching there's a lot of schools that need coaches and many times no coaches offer themselves why because you're getting dimes and nickels per hour so then it goes down to they the school makes it a requirement for a coach 
to be a coach and a teacher. Why? Because they're able to pay that coach a salary because they're a teacher, which is good, which helps a little bit. But then you don't have people that really want to be there. They're there because I want to coach, but I got to be a teacher or the other way around. I'm a teacher to get paid and now I got to go be a coach. They don't care about the program as much as a person who does coaching full time. But again, a person who coaches full time costs more money or costs a certain amount of money that the school maybe isn't prepared to pay for. So you have these coaches that are now working with the top athletes because they have their own personal service or personal brand. And they, they sell themselves as this great coach. You know, now they make a phone call, they get one of the best coach, best, best athletes in the area. Then all of a sudden it's, hey, I coach so-and-so. I've been working with these 10 athletes and they were the state's best. That's great. They did work with those athletes. You know, however, however they trained them. They were their trainers. They weren't their coaches. You know, it's... But then they're, they're, they're perceived as this superstar great coach. So you kind of have to, if you're a parent, kind of sift through all the ins and outs of what a good coach really is. You know, my thing is a lot of these coaches are getting phone calls because parents need a private coach. Then the kid already is good and talented and the coach tags their name onto that athlete. And you can always tell because there are some schools that I've seen where athletes have come in as some of the state's best athletes. I'll keep it very broad because I don't want to bash anybody. But the state's best athletes and they only improve a tenth of a second or they only improve one or two inches in their whole four-year career at that high school. You know, it, it's, it's, it's tough. Um, I'm trying to keep this positive, people. I'm trying to... And the other part is you have these coaches that are just next to a coach and that coach decides to retire and that coach says, hey, you're next to me. How about you take my spot? Now, all of a sudden, you have a person that has no idea what he or she is doing in this powerful position. You know, when it comes to coaching, uh, it happens all the time when it comes down to colleges is you ha you'll have a athlete who needs a job, you know, or they want to coach college track and they just finished college and they come back and do a grad assistant or they intern and they become a volunteer coach. And then that assistant coach who's already locked in receives a head coaching job somewhere else. Guess who the person is next in line? That 21, 23, 24 year old volunteer coach who just graduated is now the head assistant you know, or the jumps coach or whatever. And they're getting paid twenty, thirty thousand dollars and they're happy. Why? Because they were making no money the past four years while they were a student athlete. That's who is coaching not all, but a good handful of our collegiate athletes. Now or you'll have your athlete who is just out of college with their kinesiology major or whatever that's looking. Those are the ones, I guess I just repeated myself, those are the ones who are coaching these athletes. Now, even we have those coaches who, who name drop at the college level. You'll have that coach who is an assistant who was just a graduate assistant last year who is on his first or second year coaching who is there for maybe those one or two years but they name drop and say I worked with these 10 athletes I trained them you know and now they're jumping from this far to that far or running from this this speed to that speed you know I coached so and so who, who was a two-time All-American and it's like you really didn't coach that person you were there and you helped them out. You helped them get to this certain level of success because you reiterated their workout that the head coach did. You know, or they were already the nation's best athlete and you became the coach during that tenure while they were there 
and then now you're dropping their name you know or at the professional level you know it may be I worked with these 10 world-class athletes well because you worked at LA Fitness and they came in for a session one day or you worked at an athletic training company and these 10 athletes came in you worked with them yes you did but you didn't train them you weren't their coach you were their trainer for the day or for the week while they're on spring break or their off season here's a perfect example I used to work at Athletic Republic and during that time there were a handful of professional baseball players that were used to go to Cal State Fullerton because they had a really good run they went to Cal State Fullerton they ended up in the farm system for the MLB they came and trained at Athletic Republic I was the trainer there at Athletic Republic so these five athletes came to to me and I was the one who took them through workouts. Red Turner, who plays for the um, Dodgers, I literally took him through workouts. Um, last name is, I think it was Wright. He played for the Mets. I took him specifically through workouts. Lucas Duda, who played for the Mets, same thing. I took him through workouts. I'm not going to sit here and tell you I trained them. This is who I worked with. I'm not going to sit here and drop those names that I was a part of their success because to be honest I wasn't. All I did was have a sheet of paper in front of me and take them through some specific exercises that I thought were best for them. I literally gave them some tips on how to run faster, how to, how to lead off in a uh, cognitive way that helps you generate the most amount of force. Now could I take a picture of them? and promote their success on my Instagram page I could I could do a lot of that stuff I could sell the heck out of them and say I worked with them and I got them to this level when reality was I did not Cal State Fullerton the coaching staff there did you know if they had any private coaches with during that time or their high school coaches all these things what I'm trying to get at are the main influences in their actual progression which and that helps to um, that helped to get them where they are. Another perfect example, Corey Crawford, my man. All right, Corey Crawford is a professional long jumper. He is now training at the Olympic Training Center under uh, Coach Jeremy, and he's doing really well. He's going to be one of the next, you know, world class jumpers. I mean, he already is, but he's going to be the next, like, home. What's it called when you when people at home know who your name? household names right so the story is I met him back man when he was a junior in high school and basically the coach at his high school coach was one of my friends and said hey can you I got a really good long jumper he's jumping 19 feet can you uh, give him a couple tips so I watch him do some run throughs I watch him long jump and I say hey bro your 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 approach for your runway work is it's not it's not good like you're you, you're dying out you're losing a lot of speed do these three things I helped him get on the board I got as a step down you know he um, was fluid on the board and I was like you should be jumping about 22 feet well fast forward that season he went from 19 feet to 22 feet he improved just like that because of the one tip that I gave him fast forward even more the very next year as a senior he broke the um, Carl Lewis long jump record for the state of New Jersey of 24 feet he went 24 feet 5 inches or whatever all I did was excite him I gave him one little piece that helped him want to do track and field he already had the talent he then earned a scholarship to Rutgers where he then improved to 27 feet 11 inches he was all American indoors and outdoors he just really improved again the coaches at Rutgers helped him hone in on his ability and developed him now he's living in San Diego at the Olympic Training Center training with the greats well I'm not gonna sit here and say he was one of my athletes he wasn't to this day he tells me hey thanks for the motivation you helped me 
you know, keep everything positive. You help me stay motivated. You help me um, open up doors for me to get to where I am. That that's it. You know, I don't sit here and 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 boast about I made him. I trained him. I gave him a couple tips. And there, are, I'm pretty sure there are kids and coaches now that that have watched some of my my videos that have done some great things. You know, I will say good job to yourself and the coaching staff that helped you and etc. But I won't shine light on myself and make it seem like I'm this great superstar coach, even though I really, really, really do feel that I am. Okay, all right. So I feel like I got into the zone right there, right? What I'm trying to say is, you have coaches that drop names to make themselves look better. My thing is, just get to work. Get to work, let the numbers speak. So with all that said, now there are 30 minutes into this podcast, is here are some, some solutions, all right? What I feel is, when I go back to that conversation about, you know, when you pay for a Taco Bell meal versus pay for a, a Morton's meal, you expect to the price next to it to represent the actual value and quality of what you're getting. Um, that comes down to the coaching. I really feel that we need to figure out how to pay coaches more. We have to. You know, at the high school and development level, a lot of times coaches say at the college level, I got to deal with these high school coaches that don't know what they're doing and they're teaching these athletes bad habits. Then I get them at the college level and I got to spend one to two years getting rid of all that dumb stuff they do. I think you're right. You do have to deal with all that dumb stuff they do. But what if we were to set up a certain structure that paid these youth aged athletes a better pay. Would that change the quality of coaching? Would that help develop these athletes to be better? You know, it's it's a, a serious question. And when you really think about it, is if you know college high school coaches were getting paid just half, half of the amount that these college coaches were. So we're looking at fifteen to twenty thousand dollars for high school coaches. Now we're looking at $2,000 per month, right? Whatever the math will come out to. Now we're talking about, okay, now coaches might want to be there or more, more inclined to want to stay 15, 20 minutes longer to work with their elite athletes or to work with the kids that have no idea what's happening. That may be a motivation. I'll tell you right now, it is a motivation because when I started doing and becoming more successful with my club stuff, and was able to live and go hang out with my friends and have brunch on Sundays, man, I started to say I'm happier because I'm not worried about taking the bus to go coach these kids. I have a car that works, and if it, if the tire goes out or I'm having car issues, I can pay for it. I'm not stressed out about it. You know, these things are what is very important to these athletes, happy coaches. So if we can figure out a structure, the solution that I have for the structure is just to figure out how to raise more money. Maybe the schools can raise more funds. You know, that just doesn't pay for the, the, the student jerseys. It pays for the staff. Um, maybe we figure out ways to create credential programs or, you know, I don't know. Just how about we talk about this? And if you have any suggestions, please simply Comment below in this section if you're on YouTube, right below. Send me an email. I'll do another podcast about these ideas. Then maybe, you know, whoever has this money can help us. Maybe it's the taxpayers. I, I don't know. I have no idea. Long story short is we need to start funding these coaches. When it comes down to the youth level, there are ways to get money like grants with USATF and so on. They raise money to... Um, help fund these programs, which will essentially kind of go to the coaches, which is good. However, USATF is just one structure. It's just one people. We need more versions of USATF. I feel like USATF does a good job. However, no one is really 
adding value to USATF. It's just them doing their own thing. A side note to kind of follow up with this with this idea is baseball has the farm system. MLB has the MLB, then they have the farm system. In the farm system, they get paid. So athletes are getting drafted out of high school, out of college, and the second they show up to, to, the, to the camp, they're getting paid. You know, it's a little bit of money, but the coaches are being paid. You know, the officials are being paid. It's an organized system. We should follow that. You go overseas, kids are getting paid as professionals at 16 years old. Guess what? The coaches are also getting paid as professionals at whatever age they are. The structure is way different. You know, I think that would be a huge difference when, when it comes down to our development of athletes. You know, right now, I literally have four 18 foot or more girl long jumpers on my team and one two two of them have been with me for longer than than uh, four years one's been with me now for a couple of years and also had an athlete that is already a phenom but she's a part of this team also I didn't even factor her in but I knew I had a, a strong team this year and again I was only able to give them more assistance and more motivation because I was their coach, not their trainer. Now, of course, other coaches can probably have the same impact. However, the numbers that I have across the board are really impressive um, to myself because I'm looking at it like, wow, this is pretty impressive because these are some college marks being produced at the high school level. Anyway, so the other suggestion that I have this is more of a personal thing is let's sponsor good coaches maybe Nike or I don't know Adidas maybe even just an insurance company why not give back to the community by instead of giving kids a play day or a meal uh, a meal is important um, you know bringing a carnival to their school to make them happy or take them on a trip to the zoo how about you use some of that money to take them on all those things to help the kids obviously but why not help the people who are directly have that directly have their hands oh, I'm not saying it right how do I say it basically the coaches and the teachers why not give more money to these people who are influencing these kids we have after school programs why not give more money to these after school programs to help offer a better service that help these kids become happier that want to do more with their lives why not give more money to these coaches that are producing great athletes and that are really helping you know because they're giving back to the community to do more my thing is like I've helped in the past seven years that have gone through my program about 17 to 20 athletes get to the Division I level. You know, half of it is they're just smart and they're good kids. The other half is they're athletic, you know, and I'm just adding in uh, track and field experience when it comes down to jumping. But it's like, why not um, highlight these coaches and give them a contract? Maybe say, hey, you know, you've been doing a great job. We're going to give you $10,000 for this year. And maybe now that coach is more excited to coach harder or do more for the community because they're getting $10,000. And now they're a sponsored coach. You could even say, well, what we're going to do now is we're going to give you incentives. If you can help produce, you know, 30 kids that can reach these marks or whatever we can figure that detail out we're gonna give you a bonus or maybe just give you clothes even if even if it's not money we're gonna give you clothes we're gonna give you a product sponsor because right now these sponsors are only sponsoring professional and elite athletes why because the elite athletes gonna make the national team and when they're on the national team they can do a commercial when they do a commercial with this familiar face they get paid and all of a sudden their brand becomes recognized well let's recognize these coaches that are helping these athletes because the athlete that you want to promote 10 years down the line from now 
is being coached by a volunteer coach right now. And that athlete is learning bad habits. Then they're going to go to high school and continue poor habits because this quote, you know, lack of quality coaching, get to college and now they're behind. They're behind on their ability. But what if that brand would have sponsored this kid at, you know, or a coach who had a seven year old athlete who was doing really well? That coach was very excited to get that kid developed now at the high school level. The coaches are making more money. He receives this athlete who was a phenom as a youth, now is in high school, and is doing even better. And that coach who cares about coaching is coaching this athlete better. Now they get to college, and they're putting out professional marks. Now that brand can say, we've been sponsoring this athlete or these coaches this whole time. And now that athlete is going to sign a contract with that brand why because that brand is, has been a part of his or her life the whole time i probably lost you but i hope hopefully i didn't and you get what i'm saying so now what i'm going to end it is in this podcast with is i would love to be sponsored if you are unsure about what i've been doing please check out kenanbriggs.com I've been, you know, blogging now for, I don't know, since 2009. Um, I've helped a lot of athletes get a lot of things done. I have a club team, which is a nonprofit. I've been doing so much stuff and I've sacrificed so much. And I'm pretty sure there are many coaches that have the exact same story. However, I'm announcing this on a podcast right now because that's the way that I do things. But what I'm saying is, Sponsor me as a coach, whether it's with product, because I got to pay for sweats, I got to pay for shoes, I got to pay for all these things, I got to pay for equipment, my cameras when I do my editing, um, and uh, the analysis for these athletes, uh, you know, all these things, and it would be great to have either product sponsors, the money sponsors, well, I, I'm sure will come later on, but the product sponsors will be a huge thing and it will just help so much more. You know, how do, how do I say it without being needy? But basically, a lot of these things, the money that I get, I put right back into myself that pays for my business. I'm reinvesting everything. And what if I had a product sponsor? I had a product sponsor with two times you when I was competing professionally. But I had to continue jumping far. When I didn't jump far, when I didn't make USA Nationals, that product left. I feel that I was doing for myself at that time. I was selfish, which is fine because I wanted to do things for myself. I trained myself. You know, I, I was working. I was working as a trainer because um, I enjoyed it. But it was to allow myself to have the resources to train. You know, no, and the equipment. But now I'm giving back to the community. Why can't I get sponsored now? That's the real question. I'm going to end it there. If you survived this 43-minute podcast and I didn't go off too far because I didn't write too many notes. I kind of just went off and started talking. Um, hopefully you stayed and enjoyed it. And again, if you have any comments, if you have any additions to what I'm talking about or you agree or disagree, let me know, you know, write down in the comments below, email me at info at canonbreaks.com, whatever social platform you're on, write some comments. Also, you know, uh, just, just let me know. Again, if you are loving these podcasts, feel free to become a sponsor. I literally am going hard at finding sponsors to help me develop a better program for myself, for, for the kids, for other coaches out there, for other coaches who agree with everything that I'm saying, here is a huge thing, a huge thing. Look around on Google Maps and you'll see that there are a lot of parks around. And all the parks have basketball courts, all the parks have soccer fields, baseball fields. Why don't we have tracks? Why can't we have a track in every region? And then every region um, maybe just it could be a county, it can be 
whatever. But every region has a track that's open to the public that is purchased by the region and that coaches, private coaches can come utilize this space. Then we can also hold track meets for the region. So now when we have these middle school track meets, they can have a middle school championship at this regional place. And if there are club teams around, those club teams can utilize this because I literally was quoted $1,000 per day for practice for my club team by a local high school when I was looking for a facility. I went five years using the outfield of a baseball field. And to this day, I believe it's some school or some club team in Florida, I, I follow them on my Instagram, they literally are training um, in parking lots. They are literally training on baseball fields. And it's a shame because you have these warehouses with 20 basketball courts that can be used as basketball courts, indoor soccer fields, volleyball courts, ping pong, all this stuff. But yet we have five track and field facilities you know in our district and only one has a rubber field or only one has lights if we build it they will come I don't know what movie that's from but I'm pretty sure you those who get it get it so ah, man I got so much to say we're now going on 50 minutes but let's figure out ways to make more money and if you want to talk about this ways to make more money for the coaches to bring in more money for these coaches to help develop these athletes I have a bunch of ideas so reach out to me let me know who you are and let's talk business my personal goal is to build a training facility for track and field athletes and I don't mean pro because they have those Altus has their own thing. The training center has their own thing. Why can't we develop our own for the youth sector? Why can't we develop um, a facility that you're able to rent space and multiple teams can train there? Make this big old facility and that facility will be very similar to the Ocean Breeze facility in Staten Island, which is a YMCA facility. It's a YMCA facility that they built, and they literally hold track meets every single weekend. We can make a version of that in California. We can have multiple um, of those around, and it will make its money back, and I can show you how for those investors. Okay, thanks for listening. Um, the next podcast will be coming out very soon. If you have suggestions on what type of podcast you want to hear, Please comment below. Let me know what you want to hear, what you want to talk about, and let's keep these conversations going. Thanks for listening. I will see you guys next time.